Thanks for the uh, fantastic introduction there. It's uh, super nice to, to have someone from CSS Conf family here uh, introducing me also, so thank you. A uh, huge thank you also to the, uh, the CONCAT team for bringing me all the way out here. Um, I've never been to Salzburg before, but uh, it's one of the most beautiful places that I've ever been, that's, that's for sure, and I'm uh, quite envious of uh, the students that are able to come to this university, because it is pretty. Uh, so today, um, my talk is called Useful Front-end Performance, uh, or Front-end Metrics. Uh, my name is Ben Schwartz. This is me enjoying a donut uh, somewhere back in Melbourne, uh, which is where I'm from. Uh, it's a very long trip over here, but as I said, it's, it's very nice. You can find me at Ben Schwartz on the internet everywhere. So performance is one of those topics that a lot of people talk about, and it's talked about fairly regularly. So I'm going to take us through what we know about performance so far, the basic score. Some of the rules that you've probably heard over the few, last few years of your career, or uh, things that people have told you that they've learned, or maybe just anecdotes. So let's go through the scoop. Firstly, time is money. And time is money is an interesting uh, fact when you're, when you're talking about performance because it allows us to actually do performance-based work. So it allows us to qualify to our team and to our bosses or to our other departments of businesses that we work for to say, hey, we need to do this. This is really important. And that's really easily qualified by a business like Amazon who say, when something's slow, it costs us money. When Sites are slow, sales drop, engagement drops, abandonment rises, and we've heard this time and time again. Amazon found that when they increased, or they increased their revenue by 1% for every 100 milliseconds of time that their pages took to load, which maybe you're not Amazon and maybe 1% isn't millions of dollars a year, but hopefully you can start to find some trends of what's actually happening with your site when you start to think about performance. Uh, this stat comes from Kissmetrics, um, and it says that 40% of people abandon your site when it takes more than three seconds to load. When you start to think about three seconds, uh, and then you think about delivering that content down onto a mobile device over 3G or a spotty edge connection maybe, three seconds is a really, really difficult amount of time to be able to deliver something. And Kissmetrics also had the stat that 47% of consumers expect a page to actually load that fast. So, yeah. Uh, when talking about uh, actual user interactions, Ilya Gagoric said, after a second or more, the user's flow and engagement, is, uh, engagement with the initiated task is broken. So after just one second, uh, if people click on a button and nothing seems to happen, they're already, uh, their attention span is broken immediately. Our friends from Etsy learned that when they added 160K to a page in, in file size, just total size, doesn't matter where it was from, they saw a 12% bounce rate on mobile. So for those people who like to sit on the couch and buy things on Etsy, um, they're really, really pushing those people away, which is interesting. Response size, uh, since 2010, globally across the web, this is a stat that comes from uh, hdparchive.org, which I'd uh, encourage you all to, to look at uh, after this or during my talk. Um, you can uh, go and look at any stat of anything that basically gets thrown down a browser. It's, uh, site data from basically every site in HTTP archive. But the stat here is that pages have grown uh, by three times since 2010. So page, average page size uh, back in 2010 was 650 kilobytes, and then this month, uh, 1900 is the average. So I just want to go out and say everyone on your team is responsible for, for, for performance. Back in 2008, Steve Souders, told, Steve, Steve Souders told us in his talk, Even Faster Websites, that 80 to 90% of all user performance, or what people perceive to be performance, is actually happening in the browser. It's not happening on the server. OK, let's go through the rules, what we already know. We're going to minify everything. We're going to use asynchronous JavaScript. We're going to we know that if we base 64 large fonts and put them into a style sheet, that we effectively block the other styles from loading because the browser is spending all its time downloading this. We know that we should animate using CSS and not JavaScript sometimes, uh, unless, of course, we're using something like request animation frame, where request animation frame works where the browser says, I'm about to paint. Is there anything you want me to do? And it gives you a hook where you can actually say, hey, change this, this visual. And when the browser actually paints, it means that you don't have jaggedy animations. 
We know that opacity transforms clips and filters are cheap to do because they're hardware accelerated. So your browser, your browser hands it off to your video card. Your video card is able to go and render those animations really smoothly and really quickly. We know that position fixed and overflow scroll and hover effects all have weird paint issues uh, while scrolling. So much so that uh, while talking to Mark Otto of the Bootstrap project, I learned that they actually removed the fixed header from Bootstrap because it found, they found so many performance issues and just general issues uh, on different mobile devices. We also know that box shadow can be kind of evil. So this video here uh, is from the Chrome uh, evangelism team. Uh, and you'll see that when they turn costly effects on, which basically just adds border, uh, or box shadows rather, uh, you can see that the browser grinds to a screeching halt. And of course, uh, we've popularized in our industry 60 frames per second or please leave the building. Uh, back in 2013, Adios Mahdi did a great uh, blog post um, about the, uh, let, let's see, what was it? It was the Pitchfork uh, Daft Punk mini site for their brand new record. And I, if you haven't seen this, you should definitely check it out. Um, it featured a lot of full screen video and really interesting typography and was actually a really beautiful site, but unfortunately it performed like crap. Um, Addy in his blog post goes and sort of figures out all of the reasons for why it's slow. And he does so in the, in, using Chrome DevTools here and it's really, really worth it, worth a read. So we know that less CPU burning, painting, and heavy effects equals less battery burn, and that's good for mobile devices too. For a while now, we've been saying we should only load what we actually need. We shouldn't send too much down to the browser, we should keep everything's light, everything light, we should keep it fast. Our friends from The Guardian, uh, Patrick Heyman and his team there, um, took that a little bit further. They took the idea of the fold, in terms of a mobile device or in terms of uh, just a desktop device also. And they started to look at their content and what they're actually delivering. So The Guardian is a new site. They broke it into some, ch some chunks. So here we can see uh, we have an article, we have comments, we have sharing, related content, and popular content. And I think when you run a new site, it's pretty easy to tell that Comments, sharing, popular content, related content, while important, aren't the actual feature of the, of the page that's being pushed down to the browser. So what the Guardian actually do is load all of those uh, red boxed areas using Ajax. So the user just gets the article delivered to their browser first, and then other content is loaded in. In addition to that, they actually also inlined their CSS, which is something that we've been told is a terrible thing to do and you should never do it. Uh, they went one step further and actually stored their CSS in local storage and then came up with a caching mechanism to actually go and push that out of local storage and into the browser. What's really interesting here is that they found, when they did a before and after, that they saved to six to 700 milliseconds between the content load and DOM ready timings. So six to 700 milliseconds when you're on a mobile device is probably more than half of your budget in terms of actually delivering something. So, now that we've gone through all the rules, we all know everything, right? What do we do next, and what do we know, like how do we figure out that what we've been told, or what I even just told you is true, or true for you, or uh, maybe even still true? So I wanna discuss the idea of setting a budget. How much is too much? Uh, if you're running a content-heavy site, um, maybe you're pushing down a lot of images, maybe it's a new site, uh, maybe those images are not optimized for mobile because your CMS doesn't support it and that's difficult. Maybe, maybe, maybe. But if you introduce the idea of tracking these metrics or these numbers of how big something might be, then you can start to talk about it with your team. If you set a budget of a megabyte, suddenly when somebody wants to change the design or somebody wants to work on the site, we can kind of quantify the work that we're doing. Do we need a really huge banner at the top of the site? Maybe not. If it's gonna break the budget, does that mean that we take something out? Do we replace it with something else? So we're gonna monitor all the things. I'm gonna take you through uh, the idea of real-time user monitoring, or, or RUM. Some of you have probably clicked around in your Google Analytics, there it is, um, and you'll see that you can actually get some page timing data out of Google Analytics. You can see like sort of how long the page took to load, and. That's about it. You could maybe segregate it to only people in India and maybe on a particular connection, maybe in a particular browser. So you could see what their mobile performance uh, was like in that part of the world, which is great. And you can put that in your site. You can, everyone has analytics, right? 
but there's actually a way that we can actually create our own real-time user metrics. The first API that I wanted to talk about is the Navigation Timing API, which is in all good browsers. Uh, what this, this API does is it gives you the timings for the HTML uh, down in your browser. So all of these timings here are uh, available uh, right now, <laughs> and these are obviously micro times. So you can, uh, you can take the request start time and then minus uh, the DOM content loaded end event, and you can figure out how long it took your, your HTML to actually load, which is cool. But you can actually do a little bit more. There's also an API called the User Timing API. And uh, its, its entry point here is uh, window.performance.getEntries. And that'll give you a whole slew of uh, um, metrics for every asset in your page. So for every single file in your page, we can tell uh, this, this example here, uh, we can see that it's a JavaScript. Oh, no, this one's a CSS file. Uh, it was loaded using a link tag in the, in, in the um, markup. And we can see how long it took to load and if there was any DNS uh, resolution time. We could see if there was um, maybe redirection. Redirection can be really slow on mobile devices. I'm going to show you an example of it here. This is the San Francisco Chronicle. And I just reloaded it, and I popped up my dev tools. There it is. And uh, I'm using the API here, window.performance.get. Oh, timings first. There we are. And so here's the timings that I just talked about. And that's just the HTML page, and that it's time to actually be delivered. Cool. And here's the second API. And this one, I think, is where it starts to get really interesting, and we can start to do some really interesting things here. So this is, uh, I think, the same page. And these are all the metrics that come out. This is every single resource that was loaded in that page. And we can get all of those timings and start to look at why something was slow. Maybe you've had to put ads on your site before because somebody wanted you to for some reason. And it's really hard to quantify how slow those ads are making your site. But with this API, you can actually just go and get that number, aggregate it against every customer that, you know, that you're actually delivering to, and quantify how bad that script could be. And what's kind of interesting, or where I think that this could go, is maybe when we're Ajaxing in this content, we could actually start to do timings on saying, how long did it actually take the comments to load? for this site. And we can actually go even further. Um, we can maybe think about the time to first tweet. So it's always been said that Twitter uses this as a metric of how successful Twitter is generally. How long does it take people to tweet? So I'm going to show you how we could maybe build our own time to first tweet in the browser using these tools here. Firstly, we can set a mark. Uh, and a mark is just a named time in a, in a timeline. Uh, so I'm going to say, when the user clicks the button tweet, I want to make a mark of tweet. I can then get the, uh, I can then use the measurement API, which allows me to say, measure something, call it TTFT, time to first tweet, and um, compare DOM complete to the time of when the tweet actually occurred. Suddenly, we can send all of that back to our server and aggregate it using the get entries by type API. Uh, which will return all of the metrics that we've had, all the, all the measurements that we've gone and created. So we could go and get that and deliver it back to the server and then suddenly know what our customers were actually doing with our sites as a result of maybe design changes, maybe performance related things, maybe a collection of things. But once you've got these metrics, you can actually start to deduce what's actually happening for people. Okay. And um, this, this comes from. Uh, web page test, um, which is a site that allows you to put your, type your site into, you hit enter, uh, it goes and looks at your site and gives you stats about how long things took to load. Uh, you can change the connection speed, you can change the location of what the browser, uh, where the browser is or what the browser is. And uh, speed index is an in, uh, a metric that comes out of web page test and it's really interesting. It takes the first, um, it takes a video of your site loading which is here. Uh, it takes the first uh, frame of a video of your website, and then it takes the last frame from the video of your website and compares them. And it actually lays them out something like this. And you can see at what point in time something loaded in your site visually. And where that gets really, really super interesting, can I have to click this? Yeah, OK. 
is when you start to compare sites side by side, you can really see how like the huge difference between these two pages of what an actual person sees. And so the way that speed index works is it takes the first frame, the last frame, and then diffs every frame in between, and then figures out when the site was visually complete, which is actually a really interesting metric. Um, it's when a, like when a user or a customer comes to your site and says, OK, cool, I think this looks ready to use, so I'm going to start clicking buttons, or I'm actually going to start interacting with the page. Some of you may have used Facebook before, and you may have noticed the newsfeed now has a, a rendering of a post that gets filled in later as you're scrolling down the page. I think this is based on research that Facebook have been doing to, um, to actually draw you in to your timeline faster and engage with it. And evidence shows that that's true. OK, cool. Uh, so to, uh, I guess, close a little bit, I'm going to talk about just a couple of cool, cool tools or radical tools. Um, firstly, there's uh, Pingdom and New Relic, which are fairly established um, companies. They've been around for a long time. They both essentially do the same thing. Um, they give you real-time um, statistics about your, about your users. They're, they're not very deep, but they're there and they're interesting. And you should certainly use one of them, at least. Um, and another, another tool uh, by Adam Morse and Brent Jackson, which I think is kind of interesting, is called cssstats.com, CSS uh, which, again, you type in your site and hit go, and it'll tell you all these interesting stats about your CSS. How many colors are there? How many font sizes are there? How big is everything? What crazy selectors do you use? Do you do anything stupid? And again, having numbers to, to uh, quantify your work is a really interesting way to learn about how well you're doing, or maybe if your team are working too fast and too hard, maybe you can start to understand that that is actually causing some quality issues for your team. Interesting idea. And then finally, um, this is a tool that I've been working on for um, a little bit over a year now, um, maybe a year and a half. Uh, I guess setting up and installing all of the tools that, you know, or like clicking on every website and clicking a button to say, oh, hey, I want to like get some metrics about this site when you manage lots of sites is quite difficult. Um, so I, yeah, I came up with Caliber. Uh, I've been working on it for a, lot, a long time now. And essentially, it'll record your site every day um, or when you hit an API. So if you go and hit the API and say, please look at my site now, It'll then go and um, open Chrome. I use the Chrome DevTools APIs. Um, I actually drive the browser using the same API that Chrome DevTools uses when you pop it up and actually use it. It's a really interesting API um, that's all WebSocket-based. I could talk about that another time. But um, yeah, so I come and uh, in this example, this is the CSFConf Australia website. Um, you'll notice that the graph is slowly creeping up and to the right, which in this case is actually a bad thing. Um, but for CSSConf, it's because we're adding lots of content to the page. This is as the conference gets, we learn more about the speakers, and we put more photos on there. We're just adding lots more content. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, that purple line is the visual complete line. So the site is still visually complete and ready to go in three seconds. Not too bad. OK, a uh, couple of quick takeaways. Monitor your work so you can understand it. Set performance budgets. More than anything, the budgets are for you and your team to talk about. It doesn't mean that you need to keep to these budgets, but it can become a talking point and to help you dis discover and learn about how you're building and what you're building. And finally, don't rely on what you think you know. I told you a lot of weird things that you might uh, encounter as a web developer. You need to prove it for yourself, and you need to prove it for your customers. And if your site is slow for the customers that are important, then you need to do something about it. Thank you. Thank you.